I think that's it because my wife covered the youth announcement. So I'm, I'm ready to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you love Jesus? I mean, you love him. <laughs> Amen. I just love him, you know. And, and so uh, we, we started a series last week simply called Power. And we're doing this, this theme of power all through the month of October. How many of you know the Lord says that, that he sent us the Holy Spirit, and when we receive the Holy Spirit, we will receive power. He says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And we talked last week about how, man, we were not meant to do life. We were not meant to walk in our calling. We were not meant to do the things God has for us on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural power to walk out what God has for us. I want his power. I don't know about you. I don't want to do life without, without his power surging through me and him speaking through me. So last week we kind of looked at different ways the Lord empowers us through the Holy Spirit. And you can catch that online if you were not here last week. Today, part two where I want to go is I, I want to share another one of my top tens. Another one of my top ten favorite verses I'm starting to narrow them down because I think over the years I've thrown so many favorites at you that I don't know if a guy's allowed to have a hundred favorite Bible verses. That is going to have to take a message. I could do what Kirk did last time. Hey, let me talk to him. Oh, look who it is. It's my wife's phone. Oh, he hung up real quick. That was Robert calling, who just led worship, calling my wife. I was going to say, bro, don't you know I'm trying to preach? What are you doing? Anyway. What are you doing? It's your wife's phone, a little different. But you see, my friends, another one of my favorites, like last week I shared with you John 10.10, 10, that the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, but I've come, the Lord says, that you would have life and have it more abundantly. One of my faves, love that verse. I got another one for you that is in my top 10, and, and, and it, it comes to this thing called power that we we're talking about. Listen to this. This just is powerful. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, The Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Is that not an awesome way to live your life? I don't know about you. I want to, I want to walk in that. Wouldn't you love to walk in that every day? It's like, man, I am walking in power. I am walking in love. Like this, this power idea, like that I'm walking in this supernatural power that I'm not just this slave to, to my emotions and that, and that my phone is not going off in church. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh, anyway, that was just the Holy Spirit quickened that. Do you see the power? Anyway, uh, but see, when you're walking in power, my friends, you're not, you're not a victim to your emotions. You're not a victim to the cravings of your flesh. You, you know, you're walking in power. When you're walking in supernatural love, wouldn't you love to have this walk where, man, just, it's just coming natural to you, loving God and loving people. It's just oozing out of you that you're a love machine, right? You're loving people's face off. And, and a sound mind. We were born to have a sound mind. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, man, he wants you to have a sound mind, a mind that's at peace, a mind that isn't tossed to and fro with anxiety and discouragement and fear and fretting all the day long. I know those things are real and they hit us. But here's what the Lord is reminding us. That's not from me. That's not the spirit I gave you. I gave you a spirit to walk victoriously. I want that, my friends. And can I tell you a little something? Uh, this came to my mind. My wife was talking about saying this isn't fake, you know. I, I thought of an analogy as I was up there. Do you know that church and the stuff that we talk about and the stuff that happens during worship, this is not the WWF. You all familiar with the WWF is the World Wrestling Federation? Because you see, if you've ever been to a wrestling match or if you've ever watched them on TV, this is what you see at a professional wrestling match. People go crazy for this stuff. And they cheer and they hold their signs and they boo the bad guy and cheer the good guy and all this stuff. And they love it and they get into it and then everybody leaves and secretly they know that was all fake. <laughs> it was just nice entertainment. They all got into it, screamed, woohoo, and then cheered for their guy. But at the end of the day, they walk away saying, I know it's fake, but that sure was fun, you know? And just don't tell my dad it's fake. If he's visiting here, he's one of the few people who still believes that that wrestling is real. <laughs> and if that's you, I, I also want to tell you Santa Claus isn't real. Oh! Just kidding, man. I know him personally. Anyway, um, I don't think we got any Santa Clausers in the room. They're a little older crowd. But, um, but see, this is not wrestling. This is, not, this is what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to come to church. I'm still getting over the Santa Claus thing. <laughs> Y'all got to come back in. I got to reel you back in. We've moved on. We're, we're done with that now. <laughs> Same with the, who's the other guy? The tooth fairy. That's right. He's a good guy. What else we got? Never mind. Um, what other dreams can I kill? Uh, was I talking about? There was, I was going somewhere. 
<laughs> oh, the World Wrestling Federation. Hey, it takes a young person to hear it. I like that. Because, see, that's what you do at a wrestling match. You cheer. And I, I, ask, I ask wrestling fans sometimes that I used to know. It's like, you, you do know that's fake, right? Well, yeah, I know it's fake, but it's just so fun to, to get into it and boo the bad guy and all that. Well, that's, that's fun if in wrestling, but it's disastrous if you come here and say, yeah, I go to church, and I raise my hands, and I say, praise Jesus, and I say, amen, and I clap. But when I leave there, I, say, I realize it's all just fake, and it's just a nice little entertaining thing to do on a Sunday morning. Man, if that's you, let me just tell you, this is real as it gets. You can trust the Word of God. You can trust it. It's the most real thing. It's more real than what I even see with my eyes, man. It is so real. So when the Lord says that he did not give us <clears throat> a spirit, of, of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You can take that to the bank, my friends. That's what the Holy Spirit wants you to have. That's what he wants you to have. And I'll tell you something. Uh, I, I love this verse. I love this verse because in, in, in 1 Corinthians, I want to read something to you about you. 1 Corinthians 6. I'm going to read a couple verses for you starting in verse 19. It says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. I don't know if you know this next part. Listen to this closely, my friends. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now listen, if the Bible says that my temp I am a temple for the Holy Spirit, what is a temple? What's another name for a temple? It's a house, isn't it? You're a house for the Holy Spirit. That's what your body literally is. You're a house for the Holy Spirit. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, you're a house. And say, I mean that in a nice way. You are. You're a house for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> if the Holy Spirit has moved into you, you are literally a container, a house for the Holy Spirit. And, and he says, not only have I moved in, but, but you're not even your own. The Holy Spirit doesn't want to just move in and just kind of like, yeah, you know, just don't mind me. I'll be in the corner of the house. He says, no, I want to take over, man. I'm going to rearrange the furniture in your house. I'm going to put some things in a new order. But here's the problem we have, you see, because the Holy Spirit comes in to our house. We are a house. But the old nature, everybody remember the old nature? The flesh? The flesh is kind of saying, whoa, <laughs> Wait a minute, I've been living here a long time. Who do you think you are, Holy Spirit, moving in uh, on me? I've been here a long time. And see, here's what the Bible tells us. It's in Galatians. It's in Galatians chapter 5. And I, maybe you can relate to this. I know I can. Listen to Galatians 5, 17. Maybe this sounds really familiar to you. But in Galatians 17, it says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So what is the Bible saying? It's saying in this house of ours, the Holy Spirit is, is trying to, to do something and to, to move us and to take over in our lives, but the fleshly guy is still there, and they're fighting each other. Have you ever felt the battle in your own body between the Holy Spirit and the flesh, right? You can relate to what Paul the Apostle says. That thing that I want to do, I find myself doing the opposite. And that which I don't want to do, man, I find myself doing. Because there's a war. But here's the good news. The Lord has given us power to say, listen, I want you to come to a place. And I want this for me. I want this for you. That we come to this place <clears throat> where we're walking in real power. Where it's the Holy Spirit who's running the show in my house. I want the Spirit to run the show in my house. Who's running the show in your house? Because you see, just like a regular house, we have a doorbell, right? A regular house has a doorbell, and there's a knock on the door. That's what you have when you have a house. You have a way for people to let you know that they're coming to visit. Well, can I just tell you something? We're a lot like that ourselves, you see. All day long, our doorbell is being rang for our house. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. All day long, outside things are trying to knock on the door right? You might hear some bad news. All of a sudden, bad news is ringing the doorbell. You might see something that tempts you. Temptation is ringing the doorbell. You might be, be angry because of something somebody said to you or offense. Somebody said something. Now, now you have this, this opportunity to be offended, so somebody's ringing the bell all day long. So here's my question. This is what spirit living is all about. This is, this is where we come to this place where the Holy Spirit is leading. Who's answering the door? Who's answering the door? Somebody's knocking over there. 
So that's what I want to ask you. That's what I want to focus on this morning. How do I get to a place? Because all day long, things are knocking. If you watch the news, the temptation to be fearful. So all of a sudden, you have this bad news. So either the flesh is going to get up and say, I'll get the door. <laughs> I'll take it from here. We're going to be fearful. Fear is going to answer the door. Or is it, are we going to come to this place where, man, every day we're weakening the flesh and strengthening the spirit? Because this is not fluff. The word of God is not fluff. I want to live this powerful life where the Holy Spirit is answering the door all day long. Where no matter what knocks at my door, that the spirit man in me is quick to get up and say, uh, I'm in charge here. I'm getting the door. Because the Bible says there's this war. There's this war. And then it goes on to say this. I'm going to back up one verse in Galatians. I read to you 5.17. Look at 5.16. He gives a solution here for us. He says, but I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desire, and then we, we already read 17. But here's, here's what he says. Walk by the Spirit, and you won't walk by the flesh. You won't gratify the flesh. And this is what I say to that. Well, I, I get that, but how do I lay hold of this? I, I hear this truth that if I walk by the Spirit, I won't do the things of the flesh. I like that. I want that. But now how do I execute this, Lord? How do I put this into practice? How do I, just, how do I make this the condition of my life. That's what I want to know because I'll tell you one other thing the Bible says. Let me just jump over. I'm throwing a lot of verses at you. You know why I throw a lot of verses at you? I want you to really know your Bible. I want you to know these verses. I want you to know them. And I want to show you a little while later why it is so vital. And you might notice <laughs> I probably do this every week and I make no apology for it. I try to come at you in a different angle every week to get you to read your word. You know, many of you and I watched it in my own household. Many of you take, took the 90-day challenge I gave. Remember the 90-day challenge from two years ago? Any of you who have been attending here a little while? I gave a 90-day challenge. I said, I want you to read your Bible every day for 90 days. We, we started with the Gospels. I said, read Matthew through John, one chapter a day. It's 91 chapters, so in three months you can read 91 chapters. And, and those who took the challenge and really saw it through, it's amazing the change they had. And my wife, she not only took that challenge, but she's been doing it every day since that, and I've watched the power that the Word of God has when you, when you bring the Word into your life. Get it out of your mind that it's a book. It's not just another book. I can read the Bible today. I can read this book. It's not a book. It's a meal for your soul. It's, it's power. It's an injection of power for your life. You ever wonder why it's so hard to do? Because you don't even realize the behind-the-scene forces that are trying to keep you from reading your word. How many people say, man, i got to read my word, man, i got to read my word. But if they're going to be honest, they're like, dude, it's been months. I don't even look at it. I come to church. I listen to you. But I'm telling you, you will change. You will radically change when you insert the word of God into your heart, into your soul. It will change you. I'm very passionate about that if you haven't noticed that. But now listen, let me read something to you in Ephesians, and I want to tell you how we start to walk this out, this, this power in our life, in our house. So it says here in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 22, I want to read just a couple verses. We are commanded to put off our old self. It says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. See, what I'm trying to drive home here is we have this assignment from the Lord. He say, now that the Holy Spirit is in and the Holy Spirit wants to reign and the Holy Spirit wants to rearrange the furniture, the Holy Spirit wants to get the phone, he wants to get the door, he wants to kind of kick the old nature out, the Bible commands us right there that we have a part in this. See, this whole thing about receiving power, our job is to receive, but then it's also to put the power into practice. So how do, what is my part when it comes to power? Have you ever wondered that? What is my part? I understand that I receive the Holy Spirit and I receive power, but, but do I have another part to that? Well, let me tell you something. You do. You do have another part to it. And, and, and I'm going to kind of give you a little example of what that part is. I have had the privilege of giving guitar lessons to many people over the years. I love to give guitar lessons. I just think guitar players are better people. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. No, but I, I love the guitar, and I love to teach people the guitar. And I've had many students over the years, but I've had two types of students. And, and I'll tell you, uh, they all have one thing in common, both types all have one thing in common. I've had a lot of students who try. I, they do. I have a lot of students who try. But the ones who excel are the ones who train. You can try all day long, but the ones who train, they're the ones who excel. 
And I'll tell you something. There's a reason you see Alina Howard up here every week. You know, you see Jed Howard up here. These, these are students that I've had now for a few years, and right from day one, they didn't just try. Because I have, I, you know how I can tell if you're just trying and not training? I teach you something. You come back a week later, and uh, I, I can almost picture what probably happens in your mind. Oh, man, I got lessons in one hour. I better practice. You tried. But the ones who go home and say, you know what? I got a whole week till next time. I'm going to train. You can tell. I can, I can spot it out. And I love when people train because then I want to invest more in them. Well, did you know the Bible tells us, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that we are to train for godliness, to train for it. Don't, you know, because you train for the things you love, right? If you get a new job and you want to excel, you train for that job. And if you want to get in good shape, you train. But the Lord tells us, hey, I want you to train for godliness too. I don't, you know, you're, you're training on all these other things, but are you training in godliness? And, and so we're going to jump one more time here to 1 Timothy because I want you to catch this, that this isn't Paul Rowling making this stuff up. But in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, listen to this. It says, have nothing to do, this is in chapter 4, verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Did you all hear that? Train yourself for godliness. Even if you have to put on Rocky music as you're training for godliness, whatever helps you. It says here, for while bodily training is of some value, and it is, getting into shape is of some value. It makes you, it makes you better in everything you do when you have some physical training. But... It says here, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Do you hear what that's saying? That's saying, listen, physical exercise is great. It profits some. It does. Get out there and get in shape, man. Eat good. Start exercising. But he says, but training for godliness, that works its way into every part of your life. It says it benefits you in every way. You can't even think of a way where training for godliness doesn't benefit your life. Every way. And it doesn't, it just, not only says that, but it says in this life and the life to come. <laughs> that means as we train in godliness, it's not only impacting our life here, but it's, it's impacting our eternity, how we're going to spend eternity with the Lord. And I don't know about you, I want us to be a church of people who train for godliness. Train in it. Satan doesn't want you to know that this is, re this is asked of you. But I don't know about you, if you want to be a world changer man, train. I want to train. I want to train with you. And so I want to look at just a couple ways this morning on how we do this. How do we train for godliness? How do we do it? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 6, we are commanded to take every thought captive. Let me start right there. The Bible says take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. My friends, you know where so much of our growth comes from? You want to know where so much of our training comes from? Right here. All the stuff that goes on right here in our mind. Man, that's where the battles are waged, aren't they? That's where a lot of battles are won or lost, right there in your mind. So the Bible says take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That means don't just let any thought come into your brain that, that wants to. You know what I mean? You, you are not at the mercy of, of whatever thought wants to pop into your brain. You, my friends, and I, by the power of the Holy Spirit, have control and, and power to take every thought captive. When I think of taking something captive, it's almost like you're at war, right? And, and you're kidnapping it. You're like, uh, you know, every thought, because all day long thoughts are going to pop into your head. And what you do with those thoughts will determine so much of your life, because first you think it, and eventually you act on it. It starts with a thought. Take every thought captive. This is where much of your training happens. Major training ground right here. And, I, and I'll tell you, so the, the thing with that, and, and I mentioned reading your word earlier. Here's something the Lord showed me just this week about the connection between reading your word and your thought life. And it's supernatural. Because you see, most of what we think, we're, we're putting stuff in our brain all, all week long. Conversations we hear, things we see on the news and on television that we hear other people say, comments people made to us earlier in the week, they will just pop into our brain throughout the week. Things, I mean, our brain is a, it's a crazy place, especially my brain. You probably figured out, you know, I have to live here. You just get to visit on Sunday. But, you know, your brain's a crazy place, and a lot of things come in and out of here. So, but here's what I'm realizing about the Word of God. The more you pump in the Word, think about this now, the more you pump in the Word of God into your brain, the more you push out the old and you put in the new. Because, you see, it's just like 
I don't know how it works, but I mean, you might have said something to me five days ago, and I, if you notice this, and out of the blue, I'm walking around, and that memory will pop into my head, just out of nowhere. You know, like, and it's like, because that's how your brain works. It's constantly bringing things up from earlier in the week and from your past. But the more you pump that brain with the Word of God, the more you pump that, I'm telling you, it, it's, it's supernatural. When you feed it, guess what starts to pop into your brain more and more? The Word of God. And there's power there, my friends. There's power there. You will find yourself walking around and a verse will pop into your head out of nowhere. Because what does the Bible say the Holy Spirit does? One of the many things he does to help us he brings to our remembrance the Word of God. But you've got to do your part. You've got to train by pumping in the Word of God. It, there's not a shortcut. There's not a shortcut. And, and it's, it's the thing that I want it to become addicting in your life. There are some addictions that are good. Did you know that? I want you to become so addicted to your Word that instead of every five seconds when you get a break, you're pulling out your phone to look at Facebook because that's what people do, right? Hey, I got two seconds, a red light. You know, what if you were that passionate about the Word? Hey, a red light. Let me read something in John. You know, that will change you because what it does is it pushes out those old negative thoughts and then replaces them with the powerful Word of God. Because a brain is a living, it's a living mechanism, man, and you feed it, whatever you feed it will come out. If you're feeding it God, godly things will come out. How are you feeding your brain? How are you training your brain? We need to train the brain. I wasn't even planning to say train the brain. Isn't that a great rhyme? Now watch, let me give you a little test here. Let me, let me show you something fun. I want everybody to look at the screen for a moment. So I want to show you something about your mind. If you could put that clip. Now, everybody see this train? I want you to look at the train for a second. Don't worry, we're not getting uh, weird on you. I'm going to step out of the way. Now, I want you to change directions that that train is going just by simply thinking about it. Were you able to do it? A simple thing like that. By, you, you were able by your mind to change the direction of that train. Were you not? Did everybody get a chance to do it? Okay, you can take it down. Why did I show you that? Because I needed to kill 20 seconds. No, that's not why. Why do I show you that? Because Satan would want to lie to you and say, well, you have no control over your thoughts. You don't have any control. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Take it captive. Take every thought captive and tear that thing down. Tear that thing down. And Because here's what else he says. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, here's the things I do want you to think about. Because he doesn't just say take every thought captive and good luck on what you're going to think about. But this is a homework assignment for you all, including me. This is our homework. It says in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, and whatever is excellent, think on these things. So here's your homework, my friends. Take it serious. I want you to really concentrate on what thought you're allowing to come in your brain and then replace it. Let me, just, let me just get very real with you for a second here. If you struggle in the area of purity, in, in, in people that look at pornography and have those imaginations in your head, the Bible says replace those with what is true. Because you see, you know where Satan is powerful, my friends? He's powerful in lies. He's powerful in the dark. The Bible says he's, he's the king of liars. He, he's, he lies to you all day long. He, he's the prince of lies. So what he will do is he'll try to put an imagination in your head that is completely false. And here's what you do. You, you, you need to be quick to grab that and say, that's not true. That's not going to satisfy me. Because he's such a deceiver. He will put a thought in your head and say, hey, this is really going to satisfy you. Think this through. And you got, when you're quick to pull that thing, whatever that thought might be, and say, wait a minute, let me put it through the filter. Let me put it through the Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 filter. Is it true? Is it, is it pure? Is it excellent? You know, and put it through the washer, man. Put it through the filter. And if it doesn't meet those things, get that thing out of there. Kick that thought out of your brain because he's given you the power to do it. One of the biggest ways we train is up here. You know why else it's important? Romans 12, 2. What does Romans 12, 2 say? Very popular verse. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do I get transformed? By the renewing of my mind, right? That's how you get transformed. You want to be transformed into the image of Christ? Where does it happen? Right up here. So if you want to say, man, I want to be transformed. I want to look more like Jesus. I want to be a great witness to people. I want Jesus. I want people to see Jesus when they look at me. Here's what he says. You want to be transformed? Renew that mind. Renew that way of thinking. So I'm going to challenge you. Not only is your homework to, to replace those thoughts, but this is your computer. What are you putting in this computer all week long? What are you watching? What are you listening to? 
What gossip, gossip are you participating in? What are you allowing to go into that brain? Because what goes in, it's going to come out. Feed that brain, man. Feed it the Word of God. Feed it truth. Hang out with people that are going to encourage you in the Lord. That's why I'm a big fan of church. You are better when we get together with each other. We, it brings the best out, out of us. I'll tell you a fun story. Last week, I actually prayed this, and it was just kind of funny. So, well, a brother here shared with me, he said I could share this, is uh, my man MJ back there. He was saying, you know, last week I was just one of those mornings like, ah, I don't know if I want to go to church today. I mean, he loves God. It's just we all have those mornings. You know, I, I can't really afford to have that kind of morning. But uh, <laughs> I'm phoning in the message today. Um, but, you know, so he's laying there in bed. He's like, ah. Do I get up? Do I go to church? Do I not? And he said one of his kids' toys was under the bed. And it's one of these toys that when the batteries start to die, something, a voice like, like the game will start to say, time to change the batteries, time to change the batteries. And he said he heard that, and he just felt like the Lord was telling him, you need to go get your batteries charged. And, you need, and, and he just he listened to the toy, and he got out of bed. You know, how do you know the Lord can speak through anything if he wants to get us our, our attention? Because all week long, our brain is taking in stuff. But we don't have to be a victim to it. You train by taking every thought captive. And while I'm on the Word of God, let me just say one more thing about the Word. Because you see, in, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it gives a little definition of why it's so important to read the Word of God. Like, why do preachers push it so much? Is it just because, ah, okay, you know, because you know, I've already given you some reasons, but let me go deeper into this. Listen really close. I want you to be sold on this, folks. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God or woman be complete, equipped for every good work. That's what the Bible does. That's what he's saying about his word. It will equip you for everything, every good work. You can't do it void of this. You can't. You need to equip yourself. You get equipped by reading the word. And like I always tell you, man, take it in small doses. You don't have to say, i got to kill five chapters today if I'm going to read my Bible. Because I used to do that. I'd, I'd read all these chapters like, man, I read ten chapters today. I couldn't tell you anything I read because I'm just trying to read them. But, man, now I love to read my word and just eat it and devour it and just take a little portion and just, just listen to it and let it, let it change me. I want to encourage you to do that with the word of God. My friends, are you in training? Are we in training together? Are you training for godliness? Are you training? Because I'll tell you. Who's answering the door in your life? I want you to get that in your mind this week, too. Lots of assignments. <laughs> I want you to find, as you're going through the day and a coworker says something to you that isn't so pleasant, I want you to pay attention. Who's answering the door? Is the spirit man alive and well in me? Or is he, like, non-existent in the back of the house somewhere and the fleshly guy's like there, I'll take this Holy Spirit, you know, and ready to fight? Who's answering the door when somebody gives you, cuts you off in traffic? Who's answering the door when you saw something on the computer you shouldn't have saw, who's answering the door? Who's answering the door when your spouse and you have an argument and you have an opportunity to, to take the low place or, or to get angry? Who's, who's answering the door? Is it you? Is it the flesh? Is it the old nature? Or is it the Holy Spirit? He wants to move in and take over. And I, I want to let him. I want to let him. So I have one last thing I want to talk to you about training and spend the rest of my time here for a second. Because I want to talk about not only strengthening the spirit man, but how do, I, how do I crush the flesh guy? How do I crush the old nature that's still, man, that's still alive and well much of the time, right? If even Paul the Apostle said, the thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing sometimes, how much more can we relate to that? I don't want, I want that, I want to weaken that guy. I want to starve that guy. You know, I heard it said one time, I just thought it was a great example. If two dogs are going to get in a fight, which one's going to win? It's real simple the one you feed the most. The one you feed the most. If I'm feeding my flesh all week long, just feeding it garbage, and, I, and I'm, I'm starving my spirit, man, and I'm feeding my flesh with, with the stuff I watch, the stuff I listen to, the stuff I participate in, and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, I, I need to call on the Lord for some supernatural strength, but I've been starving him all week in me. You know, who's going to be stronger? But there's a way not only to strengthen the spirit man by pumping in the word of God and by praying and by being around believers, there's also ways to starve. I'm going to go after three ways as, uh, for the last few minutes of this message to really starve this flesh guy. And so I'm going to, I'm going to pick on three areas that I think are common. Uh, one of them is, is, is just the impulses of the flesh, the cravings of the flesh, whether it's gluttony, whether it's lust, whether it's, it's you know, it's 
alcohol, drugs, that, whatever that flesh, the fleshly things that we crave. I'm going to bring up a word that I don't bring up enough. And I know you all love it, but it works. Don't shut me out for, these next, for this part. It's fasting. When you starve the flesh of food, you know what it does to the flesh? It's like a punch right in the face. It's a punch right in the nose to your flesh. Because, man, food, we, I mean, come on, we all stop for food no matter what it is, right? We rely on food. I mean, I, I've said this before. I could be a, I'm not an EMS worker, but I could be an EMS worker working on somebody, and I all of a you know, you know, look at the time. I think I need lunch. I'll be back. Because we stop for food. But when you say to your flesh, this very thing that we love so much, food, I am putting you aside because I'm working on strengthening my spirit, man. It says to your flesh, flesh, you are going to learn to be obedient to what the Holy Spirit wants. Flesh, you're getting in the back of the house. Flesh, I mean, I want my flesh tied up, handcuffed somewhere in the back of the house where he can't even get the door anymore. Fasting does it, my friends. Nobody likes to hear it. It's not fun. Most people don't wake up and say, man, I'm going to fast today. Woohoo! No coffee? Oh, I can't wait. Right? I mean, that, we don't get excited about that. Maybe you do. I, I, man, you're a better person than me if you do. But I love the results because I want my flesh to be weak. I don't want him strong. I don't want him in charge. Right? So I'm going to fast. I'm going to teach my flesh that you don't just get anything you want. Because a lot of our flesh is alive and well. You just tick us off a little bit. Watch us go. Right? Just, just watch us go. Anger, you know, and, and just we see it, we crave it, we take it. I mean, that's, that's, that's what happens when the flesh is alive and well. But you can starve that guy, and fasting is a beautiful way to starve the flesh. Another way that the flesh likes to rear its ugly head, likes to have its way, is in selfishness. Selfishness. Greed. See, when the flesh is in control, it says, you know, we're, we're selfish here, man. We're about ourselves. We, we don't give, we take. You know, that's what the flesh does. Flesh left to itself is a taker. You look at a newborn child, as soon as they can start talking, they're not, they're not quick to give things away. What is the natural tendency? Take. I want everything I get. I'm going to hold on to it. Greed and selfishness, man. It rules us so often. But there's a way to kill that in the natural man. Giving is the, most, is the ultimate solution to greed. You want to starve the greed in our, in our fleshly man? Give. Give is the solution to greed. And I don't just mean write big fat checks. I'm talking about be a giver as a lifestyle. Teach your flesh that, hey, this is how we do things now. The Holy Spirit lives in me now. I no longer live. He's here to take over. He's here to move in. And, and this is how we do it now. We give. And you're going to hear the flesh and you're, what are you doing? Don't give that away. What are you doing? You know, I can remember when my wife and I were dating and the Lord was really teaching me this principle on giving. My wife and I were dating and, and her mom was over in Africa and she wanted to go visit her mom in Africa. And it was going to be like $3,000 to go. And, and I had just gotten a bonus at work for that exact amount of money. And so she's telling me, you know, we're, we're dating and she wants to go see her mom and uh, and so, so there's something in me, you know, the Holy Spirit, I believe it was the Spirit in me saying, you know, I just gave you that $3,000 bonus, and she needs $3,000 to go, and if you don't, she don't have it otherwise, and the wrestling match was on, because I kept thinking, well, that's got to be Satan. <laughs> God doesn't want me to give. He wants me to get a new guitar. <laughs> that would, surely would be God. But you see, something happens. Now, hear me now. When you finally say yes to the Spirit, it breaks something in your flesh. It gets your flesh's attention when you step out in generosity. There's so many people I know that probably know they should tithe and know they should give. And every time they want to write that check, it's like, oh, I can't do it. I just saw these bills I got to pay. I can't. But, man, I'm telling you, when you get free in that area, you see the power of God. You see something breaks in you when you start to follow the Spirit. Your flesh gets weak. It gets weakened. And it just it doesn't have the power over you anymore. But you've got to start stepping out in faith and obeying those promptings of the Spirit, man. Because, see, this is a house, my friends. And the doorbell's ringing all day long. And oh, that the Spirit would answer it. Oh, that the Spirit would answer it. The third one I want to pick on, just for a moment, is pride. The fleshly guy is prideful, is he not? Pride is something that we all probably wrestle with to some degree. And, and so, you know, and, and the, thing with, the thing with killing your flesh is you can't just punch yourself. <laughs> it doesn't work. You don't beat up your flesh by going, Ugh, take this. You're just a weirdo and you probably need medication if you beat yourself up. But... But that's not how you beat up the flesh, right? And, and one, of my, one, of my, one of my nemesis that I can't stand is pride. I hate when pride rears its head. Because the Holy Spirit's right there always telling me, take the low place, 
less of you, more of God. But my flesh is like, but, but, but I, want, I want to be recognized. I want to be seen. I want pride. And I've shared this once before, but one of the biggest lessons, it was so good for me. It was, it, it was a punch in the face to the pride in me, and I needed it. I needed it when I, when I was at the Creation Festival with Christopher Hopper, and we, we got to play a concert there with all these big-name Christian artists. And I, I, was, I was on cloud nine. I was feeling pretty good about myself about that time. It's 2010. I'm like, man, I can't believe I'm on this stage. And they, they had these T-shirts they were selling. Some of you maybe remember this story. But they had these T-shirts they were selling. And it had all the names of the Christian bands that were there that weekend. And it was everybody you could think of. You know, all the big names, Switchfoot, David Crowder, Casting Crowns, Newsboys, Toby Mac. And, and so I knew our name was going to be on that shirt. And, and our CD said, the name of our band was simply Hopper and Rolling. You know, so I'm, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to see my name on this shirt. I'm going to have to buy 50 of these things because I'm not prideful at all. And I was just so, so excited. And then I see the T-shirt, and it says, Christopher Hopper. I was like, well, sir, surely my name's on, on here somewhere. And, and they just casually left my name off the shirt. <laughs> and it just said, Christopher Hopper, you know. And so I was thought, okay, I got a choice this weekend. I'm going to let this ruin my weekend if I want because... Because, man, my name's not on there, and I'm in this band, and it's two of us. Or I'm just going to say, you know what, Lord? Is it really about you anyway? And can I tell you something? If pride is something that is alive and well in your life, you know how you starve it? This is a hard one for a lot of us. Just esteem others better. Like, like when you're tempted to give yourself a compliment, shift it to somebody else. The Bible says, let another man's lips praise you, not your own. You want to crush that prideful, fleshly guy in you? Begin to recognize others. If you think a compliment for somebody, before you have a chance to lose it, give the compliment. Somebody did a great job, tell them they did a great job. Somebody looks good, tell them they look good. Somebody, you know, just, just kill that because what it does is it will weaken the fleshly guy. And I'm telling you this works. The more you weaken him, the more this becomes easier. The more you punch that, punch pride, man. Punch it by, by blessing others and, and, and giving compliments and esteeming others better. Punch greed by being a giver with your talents, with your time, with, with your words, with your finances. Be a giver and, and punch greed in the face in your flesh, okay? And, 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 and take on lust. Take on the cravings of the flesh, man. Take on gluttony. I've been telling myself a lot lately, do you really need that second piece of whatever? It might sound harmless, but what it does is, first time, really, really tough. Do I really need that second piece of whatever, you know? Really, really tough. Second time, it's a little easier, Third, fourth, fifth time, tenth time, hey, this isn't so bad. Why? Because it's training. It's training my flesh to say, hmm, I guess we don't get what we want in this house. It's training, my friends. So I just want to encourage you with this, man. As we walk after power, what's our part? Ask yourself all week long, man, who is answering the door? Because the doorbell's going to ring the minute you get out of here. So something's going to happen. I don't mean bad. I'm not trying to set you up for bad. But you'll be tempted. You'll be offended because that's, that's the nation we live in. I mean, get on Facebook. I'll give you five minutes. Something will rub you the wrong way. <laughs> it won't be anything political at all, I'm sure. But uh, <laughs> something will rub you the wrong way. So I want to challenge you. Who's alive and well in me? Is it the Holy Spirit? Because the Lord told us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He is called the helper. He is called the comforter. He says, I will love people through you. Romans 5, 5, I poured my love into you through the Holy Spirit. That's what he's telling us. He says in Matthew 10, chapter, chapter 10, verse 20, I will give you words when you need words. He's there to do all that for you. So here's your part and here's my part. Flesh, get out of the way so that the Holy Spirit can be alive and well in me so that the spirit man is answering the door so that the world who's in dark looks at me, they're going to see Jesus, and I'm not blocking the view of people from Jesus because I'm letting the Spirit live alive and well in me. Let's kill that flesh. Let's step on it and say the Holy Spirit is in control in this house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I'm talking this house right here. It's time to, to get serious about some things in our life. Amen? Amen. I love you guys so much. I want you to know that. Love you all. So honored to do church with you, to do life with you. And, you know, we're in this together, man. We are about to enter some crazy times. <laughs> you know, I don't care who wins the election, my friends. It's crazy times because if you get one in there, you know, you're getting more liberal than you ever thought you'd get. You get the other in there, we might be in war in a month. So, you know, it doesn't matter. My hope is not in either one of those candidates. My hope is in Jesus Christ, man. I just want to be all in with him. 
This is a time to get our faces on Jesus. This is a time to get on our faces and say, Lord, I want you to have full control over me. Get before him and say, Lord, I want to train, man. I want to push out the garbage and put in the good, the good word, you know. I want to, I want to look like you, man. I want to be transformed. Like we said, we get transformed. Romans 12, verse 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Man, wash that mind. Get up every day and picture you're taking your brain out of your head. It might be gross for some of you. And you're washing it and putting it back in. I don't know if that's possible. We have any brain surgeons here? I don't think it's possible. But you do do that when you get the word of God in. Be intentional about it. Train for godliness. Take every thought captive so that it's such the, it's the new default setting of your life is that the spirit is answering the door. Heavenly Father, bless these awesome people today, I pray. Lord, help us in this, in this year we're living in, this time we're living in. What a privilege to be alive. Let us see it that way, that we're privileged to be alive in a time where the world, man, they need to see you, Lord. They are, there's so much fear, and there's so much anguish, and there's so much discouragement. And, and Lord, we, we know you, Lord. Let, let people see you when they look at us. Lord, let, uh, let the Holy Spirit be so in control in our lives that you answer the door, that people would see you. Lord, help us, because you are our helper. Help us to walk this out, I pray. Help us to train so that it's you who's alive and well in us. Help us to put the flesh under our feet so that you're in full control. We love you, God, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Love you guys. Be blessed.